All right, thank you for watching. And I'm sure a lot of you heard about Chebyshev's inequality, but have you heard about Chebyshev's little inequality? So this is a secret gem I found a couple of days ago. And it's kind of neat. So then it has, by the way, nothing to do with the Papa Chebyshev's inequality, which I might do in another video. And this, this version has to do with sequences, sort of. So suppose you have that, maybe it's not, a, it's not an infinite sequence, but a finite sequence. So you suppose you have a decreasing list of finite numbers, a1, a2, up to an, and same with bn, b1, b2, dot, 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 bn. Then, what baby Chebyshev's inequality says, it says something really cool. Namely, suppose you take the a average of the dot products. Sorry. Suppose you take the dot products of those two vectors, namely, sum from k equals to 1 to n of a k b k. So think about this as a dot b. And you take the average. Then here's a cool thing. Usually inequality says this is less than or equal to something. You know, like Cauchy Schwarz. But this one tells you the opposite. It tells you that this is always greater or equal to something. And the cool thing is, it's always greater than or equal to the product of the averages. So if you take the average value of this list of ak, again divided by n, and the average value from k equals to 1 to n of bk, then the average of the dot product is always greater or equal to the product of the averages. It's kind of neat. So it's a nice thing about decreasing numbers. Okay, and by the way, I feel this has kind of very nice, you know, uh, metaphysical point of view, because there are always those movies that says, yeah, we should work in teams, you know, and then we'll do stuff better in teams than doing it alone. And in fact, this sort of says that, because if you think of the, the, those two terms, this is like the contribution or the average of A alone, and this is the average of B alone, then what it says is, if you work together and take the dot product, you will always get a bigger average. So maybe the way to think about this is saying that the average of A dot B is greater or equal to the average of A than the average of B. So even if you multiply those two averages, you will never get something bigger than the average of the dot products. And careful, this only holds for decreasing things. So I guess I think you can have something similar for increasing, but in general, this is very false. OK, and here is the proof. I really like the proof. It's very neat. Consider the following huge sum. So it's the double sum, I guess. It's j from 1 to n, sum from k from 1 to n, of aj minus ak times bj minus bk. And I'm claiming that this is always non-negative. And the reason is as follows. Because suppose that, let's say j is smaller than k, then remember that the a's are increasing, that are decreasing. So if j is smaller than k, this will be negative, but this will also be negative because the b's are in decreasing. And so if you take the product of two negative numbers, you get something positive. So in that case, you're good. So again, j less than or equal to k. We're good here. 
Well, if j equals to k, then this is zero and this is zero, so we're still good here. But hey, let's say if j is greater or equal to k, I guess j is strictly greater than k, then this is, you know, uh, this index is bigger than this one. Think like a3 minus a2. So this becomes negative, but this also becomes negative, again, because we are decreasing things. So if you take the product, you get something positive. So in that case, we're also good. So in the end, this is true. And now just foil this out. So it's the sum from j and k. Okay, of a j b j minus a j b k minus a k b j minus a k b k. Okay. <laughs> all right, and now let's just put all everything. You know, uh, let's write down everything basically. So if you want the first sum. If you like, we can just write it as sum from k equals to 1 to n, sum from j equals to 1 to n of aj, bj, and minus, I guess, the sum from k equals to 1 to n, the sum from j equals to 1 to n of a j b k and by the way completely okay to interchange the sums because you know we're dealing with finite sums here this is not a series question but might be a serious question but okay <laughs> enough puns for now so this becomes a sum from k equals to 1 to n sum from j equals to 1 to n of a k b j I think for the last one, let's just write it as plus, sorry, I forgot here, the plus sign, plus sum from j equals to 1 to n, sum from k equals to 1 to n of a k b k. Okay. Huge sum, but we can simplify this now. Notice this thing now, it becomes a constant. It becomes a constant and it doesn't depend on k at all. So we can pull this out of the sum and you're left with sum from j equals to 1 to n of aj bj times the sum from k equals to 1 to n of 1. Here, the bk comes out, and we have sum from k equals to 1 to n, bk, sum from j equals to 1 to n of aj. And here again, same spiel here, this thing is just a constant. It doesn't depend on k at all. So this comes out of the sum as well. And again, same spiel here. So lots of spiel, viele spiele here. Okay. Sum from k equals to 1 to n of a k. Sum from j equals to 1 to n of b j. Again, this comes out of the sum. And then here, it's the same thing as the first thing. This becomes a constant, so it comes out of the sum. So plus sum from k equals to 1 to n of a k b k times the sum of 1s, j equals to 1 to n of 1. We're almost done. Things simplify tremendously now. Because now we're left with the sum of 1's from 1 to n is just n. So n times sum of j, I guess, uh, maybe let's stop right from 1 to n. So 
of j of a, j, b, j minus the sum of j of a, j, the sum of k of b, k minus the sum of j of b, j, sum of k of a, k, and then same thing here, plus n times the sum of k of a, k, b, k. And notice there are lots of the terms that are actually identical because no, it doesn't really matter which index we sum it with. This thing is still the dot product of a and b, and this thing as well. So, for the first term, we actually get 2n times the dot product. So that equals to 2n times the sum of j of aj bj. And also notice that, well, the sum of j of aj is the same as the sum of k of ak, and the sum of bk's is the same as the sum of bj's. So in fact, those two things are also the same thing. So you're left with minus 2 sum of, I guess, j aj sum of k, b k, okay. remember I erased this long time ago, but this whole thing was equal to s, and we found that s is greater or equal to zero. So this whole junk is greater or equal to zero, and therefore what we have now is that 2n sum of aj bj, <laughs> so I'm getting lazier and lazier here, I'm even dropping the indices, is greater or equal to 2 times the sum of aj times the sum of bk. bk. And then we're essentially done. Cancel out the 2s. And if you'd like, divide by n squared on both sides. So this is n squared. And you get that. One of the n's here cancels out. And you're left with sum of aj bj divided by n is greater or equal to the sum of aj divided by n times the sum of bk divided by n. This is exactly what I wanted to show. Okay. Last but not least, so great, you know, we are done with the proof, but last but not least, the cool thing is, this thing has a continuous analog, namely, You can do the same thing but with functions. So here's a continuous version. Suppose f and g are decreasing on the interval a and b. Then, remember, baby Chebyshev says that the average of a, b is less than or equal to the average of a times the average of b. But here we can do the same thing with functions, namely the average of f and g over a, b, which is the integral of a, b, divided by b minus a, is less than or equal to the average of f over that interval times the average of b of g over that interval. If you want to stick around, so I have time, okay, <laughs> let me prove that. And the proof is actually exactly the same as before, and maybe even easier to understand. Okay. So, proof. So, we want 
not the continuous analog of the summing up part, the double sum, but here it just becomes integral from a to b, integral of a to b of f of x minus f of y, g of x minus g of y, dx dy. And notice again, this thing is greater or equal to zero, and again, that's by doing it with three cases. If x is less than y, then f of x is greater than f of y, and g of x is greater than g of y, so this does become positive. If x equals to y, we get this is zero and this is zero. Here we're good, here we're good. And if x is greater than y, this becomes negative since f is decreasing, this becomes negative since g is decreasing, and we have for that. And then same thing as before, let's foil it out. a, b, integral a, b, f of x, g of x, minus f of x, g of y minus f of y g of x plus f of y g of y dx dy all right and let's take all those terms out a b integral a b f of x g of x and let's full b need a little bit so instead of writing it dx dy Let's write this dy dx minus double integral. All right, let's see. So f of x, g of y, dx dy minus integral a b, integral a b, f of y, g of x, dx dy, and then plus integral from a to b, integral a to b, and f of y, g of y, I guess yeah, dx dy. Now here, f and g, they're constants with respect to y, so you can pull them out, and then here, g is constant with respect to x, so pull this out. Here, f is constant with respect to x, pull this out, and then here, at f and g at constants with respect to x, so let's pull those out. And you're left with integral from a to b, okay, f of x, g of x, integral from a to b of one, dy, and that's dx, but now the integral of 1 is just b minus a, and then minus integral from a to b, g of y, integral from a to b, f of x, dx, this is dy, but again, this integral, you can pull it outside of the other integral. And then minus, same spiel here, integral of f of y, integral from a to b of g of x, dx, dy. You can pull that out. And then minus, or I guess plus, sorry, integral from a to b, f of y, g of y, integral from a to b of 1 dx and then dy and then this thing again becomes b minus a and so in the end you have a big 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 uh, big simplification i guess it's the better way of saying it you get that b minus a, integral from a to b, f of x, g of x, dx, 
minus integral from a to b f of x dx integral from a to b g of y dy minus integral from a to b g of x dx integral from a to b f of y dy and then plus b minus a integral from a to b f of y g of y dy and remember this is equal to s and s we found this is greater than or equal to zero and then notice there is you know again just as before uh, terms that look exactly equal just by change of indices here, it doesn't matter if we call it x or y, it's still the same thing. So those are the same two terms. So this is 2 times b minus a, integral from a to b, f of x, g of x, dx. And here again, up to relabeling x and y, those two terms are also the same. So this is 2 times integral from a to b, f of x dx integral from a to b g of y dy and again we get that is greater or equal to zero so the twos cancel out and then you get integral from a to b of fg is greater or equal to is b minus a times that is greater or equal to the integral of f times the integral of g and then same as before you divide by b minus a squared squared this becomes b minus a over b minus a and lastly this thing cancels out and you're left with a final inequality saying that the average of f and g is greater than or equal to the average of f times the average of g in the decreasing case. And again, I could tell you in analysis and PDEs, this is so useful because we, sometimes you want the inequality to go to the other way, but in general it's impossible, but in this case it tells us it is possible in the decreasing case. So thank you, Chevyshov, for finding this cool inequality. And again, let me know which one you like more, the you know, discrete version or the continuous version. So both are really cool. All right, so if you like that and would like to see more math, please make sure to subscribe to my channel. Thank you very much.